Hello, thanks for joining us here at CIG for another Around the Verse, the weekly look behind the scenes at Everything Star Citizen. I'm Chris Roberts. And I'm Sandy Gardner. For those of you keeping track, we are just a little over a week away from this year's CitizenCon. Uh, yes, we are. So as we continue working towards a big event, team members from every studio will be arriving here in LA next week. It's going to be a really full house. Hard to believe how much we've grown since uh, last CitizenCon here in LA. Yeah, it is. And to find out all the latest details for the event, make sure to check out the RSI site. We have a post that outlines everything from where to watch the live stream online to trophies to what backers attending in person can expect. Yep, absolutely. So check that out. Uh, every department and team have been working really hard to make sure this year's CitizenCon is a memorable one. Very cool. And of course, you'll have to wait till the live stream next week to see. But don't worry, because with a whole universe being created, there is still plenty left to share. There is always lots to share. Um, so right now, let's go visit the UK to get an update on some of the latest efforts underway at Foundry 42. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the UK. I'm Mickey Oliver, QA tester, to give you this week's studio update. After a successful show at Gamescom, uh, the team have been working really hard on the 2.6 content and also some exciting new things to show you at CitizenCon. First up, we've got David and Will to talk about the improvements to the scanners and the radar systems. Let's take a look. So radar and scanning is a very fundamental mechanic. So many other careers are going to be based off of it. Um, not just combat, but policing, um, smuggling, mining, exploration they're all going to be using radar and scanning in some way or another. So making sure that this system works for all of them and complements them um, and feels natural has been uh, an interesting challenge to overcome, not just in space, but on foot as well. So um, when you're, whether you're in Star Marine or you're just exploring a planet for the first time, the system needs to work in every case. So having an eye on working for the future, but also what do we have right now and making sure that we don't ruin an already good experience uh, has been an interesting challenge to overcome. Uh, and something that we have, I think, at some point, five or six different disciplines are all contributing to making sure that we're not overlooking one area to make one other area better. So it's, it's a continued uh, system that's been in development and something that I think we're gonna need the community's feedback on. We've been breaking it down into different tiers. So over the cross section, you take the 3D shape um, that you're detecting, um, and it works out the dimensions that you can actually see, and uh, and gives you a result from that. Um, so if you're looking at a ship, uh, sort of top down, it'll have a bigger cross section, and uh, you know side on, it'll be a smaller signal that that gets to you. As well as cross section, we've got infrared and electromagnetic, um, which are sort of systematically worked out from the items on the object that you're you're um, picking up on the radar. And uh, so the different items draw different amounts of power and give out different amounts of heat, and that's all added together. Uh, and then uh, the radar sort of looks at that signal and works out how much of it it can see um, to determine whether it's detected or not uh, and we're for the FPS we're, we're thinking of adding well we're working on adding a, um, a decibel uh, signal as well for sound so if if there's guys walking around a, um, you know, a corridor or firing weapons they'll be uh, they'll be making sound and that'll feed into the radar signal system and uh, which means we can use the same radar on a on a player as on a ship it's basically uses the same code uh, under the hood yeah fundamentally the uh, the ships and player radars uh, are the same uh, just because uh, it, it's all sy systematic uh, and players player characters NPCs all have items on them is in the same way that ships do. Uh, they also uh, emit uh, infrared and EM in the same way, uh, based on you know the power draw of their like sort of life support systems and helmets and weapons. So we've in the past we've had just passive radar uh, on um, on ships, and with uh, with Will's design we've been adding uh, new features as well, which uh, the active 
active ping, which allows you to send out a pulse, uh, which amplifies the signals that the, your passive radar might not be able to pick up. Um, and so I've implemented a, it's, it's, it's sort of done on a kind of like a golf swing type mechanic where you hold down a button, um, wait for it to charge up, and if you get it right, uh, let go, uh, it sends out a ping, which is much more powerful um, than the, the passive radar. And that, uh, yeah, with the active ping, the last quarter of the, the power up bar um, is the sort of sweet spot you've got to get. Um, if you don't, if you don't quite get there and let go too early, or if you if you don't let go in time, then it, that's when it sends out you know, a really loud signal, which uh, which other people can detect. And the guys in LA are going to be taking over this uh, scanning and radar stuff and running with it, and it'll be good to see what they do. Up until now, we've had a system in place that works great for combat. You can a ship will come into range and you can pick it up and it tells you everything you need to know about it, who it works for and the name of the ship and you can fight it straight away. But moving forward, we're going to need to know specific information that you can gather from a scan, what its cargo is, things like that. Um, we took the system and we started to implement some of those new features and make it more robust and future-proof so when, when we start working on it um, for, the, for the future careers, that stuff's already as a, as a really solid groundwork. We're going to be seeing a lot more scanning and radar focused ships, more utility ships, I guess you'd say, where the focus isn't on com combat but on gathering of information. We've seen it recently with the Terrapin, but we've also got the Freelancer DUR, um, the Constellation Aquila, ships that are designed for exploration or data gathering. Um, that are going to have additional utility mounts used specifically for scanning or increasing radar range that allows them to, to capture information. But also bounty hunters can scan a ship, look who's on board, find out their criminal status. But then also on the other side, uh, smugglers need to be aware of this system so they know how to trick it, how to stay hidden. Spies need to know how to keep themselves quiet and disappear off radar. So it's a two system of I improve my systems one way and then this guy's then trying to, to quiet himself down. Well, one of the things we're looking at is the ability to scout ahead. So a ship might jump ahead, recon an area, gather information about what, what forces have been gathered, and then bring that back to the rest of the fleet and they can make a valued judgment then of, okay, they're, they're exposed on this side, or actually, no, they're too strong, let's leave it. But it means that you can start to, to plan out larger attacks and, and have multiple stages of, oh, I've bought a Herald, which allows me to gather information quickly and run, but maybe not fight. But now there's, there's a value in, in having those recon ships as part of your fleet, as part of your, um, as part of your group's uh, collection. And also, if you don't want to fight it yourself, you can sell that information to uh, the police or to other gangs who may want to, to act on that information. Next up we've got vehicle artist Paul to show you some cool alterations that we've made to the Vanguard to make a dropship called the Hoplite. I was given the task of uh, creating a new dropship for Squadron 42. Um, the Vanguard was chosen to be uh, the source material for that. Um, the Vanguard originally has uh, a pod in the middle that can eject and be given different functionalities for different variants. Um, that plan wouldn't work for dropship variants. Um, we have to strip out all the walls to make space for the seats to make sure that people can walk in the interior space easily. Um, we put in the bigger ramp so people can get in and out easier, uh, bring in some cargo, a lot more space. Um, the original Vanguard had a bit of a, a tapered ramp. Uh, you can only get in one person at a time. The new bigger one, you can just walk in with four people at the same time, no problem. Uh, it'll be a much easier fit. It's not displacing any work, it's not going to delay anything, it's just, you know, it'll help Squadron 42 come out faster. The, the Vanguard Warden is black, uh, default age is black, the, uh, the hoplite is green, uh, it's a UEE ship, it's a UEE dropship, it's, it comes in the UEE livery of green, similar as the Gladius. The Warden variant had uh, the middle pod, which was an escape pod, it had beds in it, um, the dropship variant does not have that. It's, uh, it's its own unique variant. It doesn't have uh, a swappable pod in the middle. Um, it's got essentially uh, 
the same weapons capabilities, it has the same turret on top. Um, it's just that the internals have changed and it's got a bit of login ramp. A lot for you guys to discuss. That's everything for this week, so thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed our updates and we'll see you in the verse. Thanks for the update, Mickey, uh, and to the team for taking the time to share their work because they're all working very hard on CitizenCon uh, work right now. Yep, it was really great to see the Vanguard transform, actually, and it sounds like the radar and scanning update is going to open up some pretty cool and big gameplay. Yes, definitely. Uh, so it's one of the things I'm really excited by because uh, it's going to add a whole extra dimension to the Squadron 42 gameplay that I didn't have in Wing Commanders. And then if you take it into the Star Citizen side of the Persistent Universe, it's opening up a whole bunch of other options in exploration, in sort of piracy, in policing, enforcement. Um, so it's going to be really cool. Very cool. And definitely, I'm going to need somebody to uh, be the scan operator on my Connie. Yes, I have a feeling uh, skill scanner operators are going to be in high demand. I will perhaps train to be your scanner operator. We'll see. Oh, wow. <laughs> now that we've gotten a glimpse at what our devs have been up to, let's take a look at the hard work you guys have been doing. Here's this week's community update with Tyler and Austin. Hey, everyone. Tyler Whitkin, community manager in the Austin, Texas studio, here to bring you this week's community update. Last week, the Aegis Retaliator won the title of Galactic Tours Bomber of the Year, landing at a spot on our pledge store for one week, and that sale ends tomorrow. Fast forward to this week, and now we have the Saber vs. the Delta competing for the title of Galactic Tours Dogfighter of the Year. We're going to post the results of that poll on our website tomorrow. Now, I know we've been talking a lot about Bar Citizens lately. Just last Saturday, there was an event in Denver, Colorado, Vienna, Austria, and Rennes, France that all looked to be an incredible time. And thanks to the efforts of a citizen named Rico, you can now go to barcitizen.sc to find all the news and updates about bar citizens around the globe. The site is jam-packed with information and even an interactive map to help you find events in your area. Speaking of bar citizens, we're going to be hosting two official events the weekend of CitizenCon, Friday and Saturday night. You can find out all the details about those events on the CitizenCon information page, which is on our website now. Now it's time for this week's MVP award. A huge congratulations to Leadhead for his extraordinary efforts in creating a 300 eye sand sculpture. This was a week long endeavor and they even had to battle it out with some rain, but it turned out fantastic. So congratulations again, Leadhead, you're this week's MVP. Lastly, the week would not be complete without Reverse the Verse, so make sure to tune in live tomorrow at 8 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time at twitch.tv slash sigcommunity, where we're gonna talk about everything that you saw in today's episode. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We'll see you in the verse. Wow, that sand sculpture was awesome. Between 3D, 3D printing, oil paintings, Legos, wood carvings, and now sand, I'm excited to see what the community will create next. Yes, well, maybe they'll have a Close Encounters uh, tribute next. You never know. And now I'm trying to picture which ship would look good um, shaped out of mashed potatoes. Yes, made by Richard Dreyfus. Um, so speaking of shaping ships, um, let's catch up with Andrew Nicholson and Johnny Josevius in the UK to hear all about the new improvements they've been making on the uh, flight model. For the upcoming 2.6 patch, we want to start uh, digging into balance on, on a larger scale than we have done before. Kind of go back to the drawing board a little bit, not too far, obviously. Um, so that meant finding out where do we start? What's the first thing we do? There's always dependencies with everything. So try and find the fundamental thing that we might end up changing that's going to affect a lot of other things. The flight model was, was, was that thing. Um, and what we decided, and what we started to do to test it, was to pick one ship, we picked the Gladius, we lowered the SCM speed to try and make combat not really slower, but a little easier to control, and so you're not you know, flying backwards and forth at really high speeds. I mean, the, the Newtonian physics that we use, the IFCS flight model, is complicated, it's complex, it allows for a lot of depth to the combat, but it's also kind of intimidating Especially when you've got you know, a, an SCM speed of 350, you've got ships going really fast and a lot of um, throttle management to do to get decent in combat. So uh, we took the Gladius, we lowered the speeds down to about, I think, 140. I mean, it's like a rough halving of the speeds to see how it would affect gameplay. And then rebalanced a few ships around that. 
okay, make everything slower, how does that feel in a dogfight situation? Um, and also, not just speeds wise, but we sped up the accelerations. Um, so the stop times were lower, which meant there was less slide when it comes to ship, ship maneuverability. Uh, it can take a little bit of time to get to top acceleration when you're turning, so that even that staggers the, uh, the speeds as well. Makes everything feel heavier, gives, gives the ships more character. But to sort of fill that gap where we've cut into the SCM speeds, we've, we've um, we made some changes to the afterburner. Um, we'll be making further changes to the afterburner, but we wanted to you know, tweak the fuel limits on that so people used it more. The idea that in a combat situation, if you're not moving fast enough or if you need to escape faster, afterburner is what you'd use now because it should be like a, a uh, something that you, you don't use all the time, something you use every now and then just that just gets you out of a combat situation if you need to. Afterburner didn't really have that much of a purpose before, now it does. We set up some tests where all the designers were invited to play test and see what their opinions of it were. And it was mostly positive, you know, say overwhelmingly positive, which has meant we've put together a patch uh, uh, based on the 2.5 build. So it's like an interim patch that includes fixes, well, rebalancing of the ship speeds. But we'll go out to Evocati for them to play test and give us feedback on that. Um, and eventually more players will get to try it too, if it's uh, favorable. Or, you know, if it's not, we'll, we'll still try and make changes based on that too. Ship flight, ship handling is the, is the main fundamental. What we build upon from there is, uh, and, and ship balancing will be ship shields, ship health, missiles and weapons. Right now I'm starting to look at weapons, but we've already done a pass, which should be in the Evocati build as well, on shields. And what we did was, we've got some sort of pre-planned numbers, future numbers, where we wanted to take the shields later, when they'll be redeveloped and refactored. Um, and we sort of ported those into the old system we have with the shields which should mean we get a little taster of, of how those shield classes might perform. Um, and I expect there'll be a lot of feedback on that and there'll be a lot to change. Um, but that's why we did it. It's a, it's a good chance for Evocati to get hands on it and go, eh, that's not quite right. And we'll react to that when we can. But yeah, the missile changes, I think uh, Johnny will be talking a bit more about that. Um, so the problem we have with our current missile rack system is a lot of the missile racks are bespoke to ships and that they're tied onto them, you can't swap them out for any others. You can swap the missiles in and out, but we'd rather you have the choice to be able to swap it out for a different rack of a different size so you can put different size missiles on there if you prefer more of smaller ones or a less amount of larger missiles. Um, another problem is that a lot of the um, size allocations we had on the missile racks that we've got at the moment is that some would be size three that can hold for example, two size three missiles, and some will be size two that can hold two size three missiles. So we really wanted to just bring all that in line, fix the problems with that, and then obviously build a system that's flexible enough for, to allow you to swap in and out these missile racks. Say for example, if you don't have a ship that has a bespoke missile rack on there, like the Starfire Gemini rack on the front or the Constellation wings, uh, you'll be able to use one of these new missile racks. The, uh, the Frankfurt Arts have been working very hard on actually making all of the missiles the correct size, so all size one missiles, instead of being huge, having huge variances in sizes, they'll now be the same size, but we'll still have the opportunity to make them look unique. And this just means that instead of having these different size missiles floating away from missile racks, they'll actually be connected to the missile racks properly, will disconnect properly, and it'll, it'll look good. If you play something like an FPS, you'll have your sniper rifle as something that is the long-range powerful shot weapon. You'll have your SMG that is your burst, uh, kind of like high rates of fire, low damage, kind of high spread weapon. You'll have a shotgun that's high spread, very high damage. So we kind of wanted to reflect that in our ship weapons. So that if someone's using a cannon, you immediately know that they'll be trying to engage you with it from long range, a repeater. You'll kind of have an idea of what the fire rate will be, kind of how much damage it will cause and things like that. So that's not to say that all all cannons will be the same and all repeaters will be the same. All of the many different things that can have varying effects on the ship weapon statistics. So if it's, for example, an energy weapon over a ballistic weapon, it might fire faster. It might consume more power. 
Um, and if it's say if it's you've got additional things under energy, so additional damage types under energy. So if it's a laser weapon, if it's a plasma weapon, there will be different attributes to the projectile it fires, but also to possibly the gun's rate of fire, its power consumption, its accuracy, and all of these things. We want to get these changes in on our current set of weapons uh, just to make sure that we can get those locked down first and make sure we get them feeling good with the new flight model. Uh, and then in the near future, we'll hopefully start getting some of these, getting some more variation in there, getting some of these additional damage types in and making these weapons feeling more and more unique. Yeah, I can't wait for the players to test all the tweaks firsthand when we implement this into the alpha. Do you think people are going to have to adjust their um, flying styles as these adjustments come in? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, actually, I think it's going to give a much more fun uh, close feel, up, you know, up close feel to the dogfighting, uh, which is sort of what we've been looking for, that sort of visceral sort of wing commander feel. Uh, and of course, we've got these beautiful ships that Nate and his whole ship team build, and we kind of want to show that off. And uh, it's actually kind of ironic because it's exactly uh, sort of the process that I ended up going through like 24 years ago when we were doing Strike Commander. So Strike Commander uh, wasn't based in space. It was sort of, uh, you know, mon jet fighters in this sort of futuristic vision of uh, the, you know, the earth where mercenary squadrons were working for the highest bidder of the corporation. And um, we'd sort of based all the, you know, we'd done accurate flight modeling and all the, uh, you know, speeds and everything was, you know, based on what an F-16 would be or a MiG-25 or, you know, the various uh, craft that you would be, mm -hmm. fighter planes you'd be fighting with. Uh, but we found when we were flying around and dogfighting that we really weren't getting this sort of up close dogfighting feel that, uh, you know, we wanted and sort of, you know, Wing Commander sort of had from what was done previously. Uh, and, you know, it wasn't helped by the fact that resolution was really low, 320 by 200 and 256 colors. Uh, so we were trying to, we were racking our heads to see how we could do that better. And we basically said, well, let's try halving the speed of basically the distance and speed of everything. And when we did that, it sort of felt right. So even though it wasn't fully, uh, you know, actually accurate and right, it was, it felt good as a dogfighter up close firing guns. And that's kind of the same process we went through here on, uh, on the flight model changes we've done. So we sort of, crept, the speeds crept up over time and uh, you know, everyone gets further and further apart and now we're bringing them back together for a sort of more up close sort of wing commander style dogfighting, uh, but with a much more sophisticated physics model and all the rest of stuff. So hopefully people are gonna like it, but that's kind of up to the community. It's kind of the process that we do. Uh, so the first up would be the Vicotti and see what they like. And then after that, the larger group of the community, but we're pretty excited by it. Wow, that sounds like I am going to need to up my Arena Commander game, uh, which fortunately is a little easier thanks to Zane and Trevor. And speaking of those guys, we now go to a first look at the work they've been doing on our brand new lobby interface. The initial user experience and the onboarding experience uh, in Star Citizen kind of needed a, a fresh look, uh, actually an entire overhaul. Uh, so we're sort of burning the old system to the ground uh, and rebuilding it all from scratch uh, visually and from a code base. Um, so user experience is a lot cleaner, should be more fun to use. So the initial pass will be launching in 2.6. Uh, uh, internal feedback has been great so far, so uh, we anticipate the user base will be just as excited. You should be able to match up with your friends quicker, um, jump into a lobby much quicker. Um, you'll be able to customize your Marine and Star Marine now. Uh, we'll have unique loadouts uh, for the different factions. A big focus of the revision is having big hero pieces. Um, we have really unique and detailed planetary systems, uh, Star Marine models, uh, and Arena Commander ships. So kind of to bring out that, uh, those, those hyper details, we want you to be able to spin around models, zoom in and out of them, um, and just kind of get a feel for, for how amazingly they're built. We kind of want to do some really interesting full screen um, ship customization here. Um, the system is still pretty heavy under development, but it uh, gives you an idea of, of you know, what we'll be able to spin around ships, uh, focus in on parts and switch out items. Uh, you'll be able to drill down, <coughs> drill down into individual items and get those item stats uh, when you're swapping them in and out of your ship. Uh, so with the visual redesign, we're actually going to bring the leaderboards from the web into the game. Uh, so players have less reason to jump in and out when they're tracking you know, their score on the leaderboard. Um, you know, with bringing the leaderboards in game, we're going to actually try to expand out the system and build a uh, bigger feature set 
uh, for users to track. Um, we're going to have official ranking systems and matchmaking uh, will be a lot more improved. A few months ago, our lead designer, Zane, already showed uh, concepts, <laughs> visual concepts of where we want to take Moby Glass. Uh, so we've kind of taken those concepts and started to actually flesh them out in-game. Uh, so we have a working prototype in-game, um, and we're kind of building out different applications now, uh, the mission management system and inventory systems to kind of build a baseline style guide, um, make sure everything is readable and legible and on all different types of environments, and uh, it's just a really fun, unique system to use. The reason why we kind of wanted this to do this overhaul was to make the mobile glass feel a bit more in-world. So that includes utilizing more of the arm to communicate that this UI is associated with your arm and the projector. Yeah, one of the great features for mobile glass that we're trying to build out now is, you know, while everybody has come to know the, the blue LED visual style that we have, uh, we're, we're looking to implement a feature that will let the users kind of customize the color to their liking. Um, so if, if, if there's any issues with the blue, they can make it their pink or purple that they want. We also have uh, this idea of um, adding more customization into the home screen. So what you'll be able to do is, much like a support screen in the ship, is customize what uh, different blocks display. So we have just these kind of placeholder um, live elements here. Um, so anything can go in each of these little blocks here. Uh, and you'll be able to customize what displays where. Um, so eventually we'll have the ability to um, kind of drag one of these apps here, uh, whether it's like your UEC uh, bank account, your cargo manager, your star map, and you drag it into one of these blocks, and then what that'll do is kind of um, turn it into a read-only status like overall status display for that application. As you can see, this is our initial implementation. You can see it's a very much a work in progress. Uh, then after 2.6, uh, I'm excited to um, get this out to you guys so you guys can play around with it um, and test it. Um, it's, we're expecting it to come in roughly around 3.0, uh, so it'll be exciting. Really cool work on the lobby uh, and also the Mobi customization, a great way to end the show. Yeah, and as always, we'd like to thank our subscribers whose monthly contributions allow us to make extra community content like this. Like this show, yeah, thank you. So not only around the verse, um, but reverse the verse, the town halls, bug smashers, lawmakers, jump point magazine, uh, 10 for the chairman, the vault, uh, hangar flare, and so much more. So thank you guys for allowing us to be able to do this. Yes, thank you very much. And a huge thanks to everyone who has supported the development of Star Citizen. We could not do this without you. Yes, we definitely couldn't, so thank you guys. Um, so be sure to join us for Reverse of Earth tomorrow at 8 a.m. Pacific, a.k.a. 4 p.m. GMT, a.k.a. 5 p.m. Frankfurt, time where Johnny and Andrew will be providing further details on the flight model changes. Make sure to have your questions ready. Yeah, have them ready. And while there will be a brand new Lawmakers next week, ATV and RTV will be on hiatus, so we can focus on preparations for Citizen Con. Yes, there's lots of preparations in, in, in process. Uh, so make sure to tune into our live streams next Friday and Saturday, and of course, the big event on Sunday. Uh, I'm excited to share with you everything that we've been working on. It's pretty awesome. And again, head to the RSI website for all the details on how to watch and more. Yep. So until then, we'll see you around, around the verse. verse. Thank you for watching. So if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest in the Star Citizen and Squadron 42's development, please follow us on our social media channels. See you soon.